Um, in, in a few moments, I'm going to give a very brief overview before handing over to the presenters here, who uh, will dig into each of the topics in a bit more detail. Um, the first thing I wanted to say is that we've got time uh, very briefly for questions after each of the talks. And in order to ask a question, you click the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, or you can click the chat box. If you enter your question in, in the box, I will read it out at the end of each of the talks uh, and the presenter will be able to respond. So if, if that's all clear, uh, I think we'll get, we'll get started. Yeah, Tammy's indicating where you can ask questions right now at the bottom of your screen. So I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. Uh, so uh, with Catherine Lewis, I chair the, the uh, PGC MDD working group, and I'm gonna give a brief overview of our progress over the last few months and what you can expect from us in the next year or so. So recent news from our group is that we've had two uh, recent GWAS publications uh, from the entire consortium. Uh, one in 2018 from Naomi Ray uh, from, uh, on 135,000 cases, 344,000 controls, showing 44 uh, independent loci. And then earlier this, early in, in 2019, we had a subsequent uh, publication which has uh, found the, almost double, or well, more than double the number of loci uh, with, a, with a approximately equivalent near doubling of the sample sizes for both cases and controls. And the, and the good news is that this is, there's going to be uh, most likely a, a, another uh, GWAS meta-analysis in 2020 that's going to include many of the UK prospective cohort studies, including ALSPAC and Airwave, uh, more than 3 million participants from 23andMe, and additional samples from the Hunt study, from MOBA, from FinGen, and, and several others. So we're, we're anticipating that in 2020, there'll be a sample of 450,000 cases or more, and more than 2 million controls. So we're, we're really optimistic that there'll be another big jump in our understanding of MDD uh, in the next 12 months. Also anticipated in 2020 is the first um, uh, PGC uh, multi uh, non-european ancestry studies of uh, major depressive disorder led by carolina who's going to speak in a moment in olga this will be the first substantial non-european mdd analysis and we expect that there'll be trans ancestry analyses including uh, 23 and me data uh, substantial amounts of data uh, that will that will follow there's also going to be uh, a new analysis of postpartum depression uh, led in the pgc by jerry who's going to speak in a moment uh, and his email is shown there. Uh, I mentioned his email because we're still looking for new studies. So if you're aware of any studies, uh, any genetic studies of major depressive disorder occurring in the, around uh, pregnancy and childbirth, please reach out and get in touch with him. And also we have uh, on the call today, uh, there's going to be a presentation from Ollie about treatment response GWAS. Again, many new cohorts showing for the first time significant SNP heritability using uh, using GWAS data. So again, looking for new studies, and I'm sure Ollie, when he comes to give his talk, will we'll let you know how you can get in contact with him if you're aware of any new samples. We're, we're not going to present uh, today on the severe clinical definitions of a major depressive disorder. As you'll know, the, much of the recent advances in the group has come from uh, more minif, mil, minimally phenotyped samples such as 23andMe and UK Biobank. But a major thread of the, of the consortium is to uh, identify more clinical samples of very severe uh, major depressive disorders. And so one of these is uh, a, a study led by Patrick Sullivan and Bernard Baum, uh, which is of the genetics of, of depression treated with ECT, which has recently received funding from NIH. So this is reinvigorating studies of severe major depressive disorder in our working group. And we are again looking for studies. So it's now time to hand over to the speakers. So the first speaker today is, is, is from uh, the Psychiatric Consortium, which is a drug discovery consortium. Uh, so Laura's, I'm gonna hand over to Laura, stop sharing my screen, and then we're gonna hand over to the other presenters in turn after her. So please remember to ask questions in the chat box or the Q&A box, and I'll relay these to, uh, to Laura during, during the presentation. Okay, Laura, can you? 
Hi, yes, I will um, share my screen now. There you go. Um, so thank you for um, the opportunity to join your meeting. Um, so I'm um, the program manager for the Psychiatric, um, Psychiatric Consortium. Um, and I'm just here to provide a very brief overview of this new initiative, um, which launched in October last year. Um, so the Psychiatry Consortium is a strategic collaboration of two leading medical research charities, Alzheimer's Research UK and MQ Transforming Mental Health, um, and six pharmaceutical companies, which focuses on the challenge of identifying and validating novel drug targets to address the unmet therapeutic needs of people living with mental health um, disorders. And this consortium is managed by the Medicines Discovery Catapult, where I work as the programme manager, um, and is supported by the Wellcome Trust via a grant which funds our academic engagement work. So the consortium really acts as a syndicate um, where these partners, um, whose logos you can see here, they collectively share the funding of and therefore the risk associated with early drug discovery. And it's a new model of funding, which is unlike um, typical research grant funding, which most researchers are accustomed to. Um, this is a really collaborative initiative where we work with the applicants, we provide project management support um, and access crucially to industry know-how um, and commercial knowledge. And it's a real collaborative effort on these projects between the PI, the pharma partners, and our partner CROs to robustly validate targets to industry standards above and beyond um, what may be achievable in an academic research environment. So if I just um, to the next one. Um, so just to give you a very brief overview of how um, our calls run, it's the next call is going to be in spring. Um, it's likely to be the end of April. It's not quite confirmed yet. Um, but likely end of April time. Um, and very briefly, we you see from the diagram in the middle, this kind of cycle of funding that we go through. Um, we request very high level applications from PIs, um, two to three pages. Um, and we perform a very initial scope assessment to see whether the project meets our criteria, which you can see on the right. Um, and that's really just to show that we're looking for preclinical projects that are really validated on the validation of um, the central on the validation of novel targets for psychiatric conditions. Um, not limited to those listed here, but these are the primary ones that we're looking into, in addition to the psychiatric conditions associated with dementia, um, for example, depression and anxiety. So if an application passes this phase, the partners decide whether they're interested in pursuing the project. If two or more partners express an interest, because this is a syndicate, we have to have um, a few partners involved. We, we then proceed to work up a full project proposal and budget with the PI and with a contract research organisation. And if that's approved, we then go to delivery and those projects are delivered um, in collaboration with the partners and with the CROs. So it may be that an aspect of the work is delivered by the PI at the university or within an SME. Um, and the partners take on um, maybe the medicinal chemistry or another aspect. Um, and likewise, the CRO will perform that role as well. So we aim to have around three funding calls a year. Um, this will be running for the next three years. Um, and all of the details of upcoming funding calls and um, any terms and conditions and further information about the scope and the kind of projects that we're looking for can be found on our website. The link's just there on the slide. Um, and we'll also be presenting at the, um, a workshop, which is specially um, co-hosted between ourselves and the PGC at the annual meeting in London on um, the 1st of May. So I'll be happy to take any questions now, um, but also if you're attending the annual um, meeting in London, then we will be there um, discussing the consortium at that point as well. Um, and on the website, there's forms to get in touch with us if you want to discuss any projects in more detail to see whether um, something you have in mind might be um, of interest or in scope for us. So that's me. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Laura. Does anybody have any questions? We don't have, ha none have come through so far. Okay, well, it's, uh, it's not too late um, if there are questions. I think Laura has to leave the call uh, shortly, uh, but if there are questions for any of the presenters at the end and you, you wish you'd ask them, if there's time at the end, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll move on to them at that point. 
Um, so thank, thanks very much, Laura. Um, thank Carolina, you. Are you, would you like to uh, share your screen? So Carolina is going to present uh, her work on the trans ancestry analysis of depression. Hi everyone. Um, yes, so I will report some results from the Genome Wide Association study in diverse populations. Most of you will be aware that um, there is a severe underrepresentation of individuals with non European ancestry in most um, areas of, of uh, GWOS for different outcomes, and that includes psychiatric outcomes. So we started um, in an intense effort a couple of years ago and one of the advantages in this context of depression is that it is um, a comparatively prevalent disease so we could tap into existing data resources and um, use uh, biobanks and, and other studies like that so doing that we have been able to collect uh, sorry, just getting rid of this. We've been able to collect um, a very large number of cases, so up to 80,000 that we're analyzing, and over um, a million controls. And as you can see here, so the two um, largest groups in terms of ancestry are individuals with East Asian and African ancestry. And that includes um, some studies that you know, were carried out in, in um, countries in Africa or Asia, but also a lot of um, individuals who come, for example, from the UK or the US um, and are ancestrally African or East Asian. And those are the two groups I'm going to focus on for this talk. So one thing to keep in mind um, that's a real challenge in this context is that even though there's a lot of evidence that depression is a universal disease and, and can be found everywhere. Um, there is a lot of variation in the epidemiology of depression and also in the symptoms. Um, and that's an example here. Um, so it's different terms, different ways uh, depression is described. And eventually you could ask if it is necessarily always the, the same identical disease. For us, that's a challenge because we have to measure depression in some way and um, we need to make sure that we're actually looking at the same outcome um, and people report it similarly when, when we do our analysis. So the first group we've been analyzing are East Asians. Um, so here we have about 11,000 uh, individuals who we considered affected with depression um, and that was based on different kinds of criteria including uh, depressive symptom uh, questionnaires and around 80,000 unaffected individuals. Um, they are from different studies and the two largest contributing studies are uh, Converge and China Kadori Biobank. Um, you can see on the left we did uh, not have a problem with inflation and some suggestion that there might might be some um, interesting looking loci, including one um, AGMO that was genome-wide significant in, in this analysis. So this um, variant is located in an intron of um, the alkylglycerol monooxygenase gene, um, which cleaves bonds um, of ether lipids, and that's actually an essential component of brain membranes. And this particular variant has also been linked to alcohol intake frequency, for example, in UK Biobank and other resources. Um, and in particular, we find it to be consistently associated in the two largest studies contributing to this uh, work. We then also looked up this variant in um, individuals with European ancestry. So the largest data sets from the PGC MDD group um, so far. And, you know, also using different versions of that data, as you can see on, on the right, we found consistently 
that it's not associated, neither the lead variant nor any of the variants correlated with it have, you know, have um, small p-values. So that might suggest that this is a variant that's actually specific to East Asian ancestry. We also estimated the transethnic genetic correlation, and we did that based on uh, each study rather than the, the overall meta-analysis in order to decrease the heterogeneity that uh, we have. And um, for Converge, that's been previously estimated, the transethnic genetic correlation with the European ancestry PGC is around 0.4, which is um, relatively low. If we look at China Kadori Biobank, um, quite a, a different study, population-based, we find a similar genetic correlation of 0.54. And this is um, quite different from other psychiatric outcomes, which show much, much higher transethnic genetic correlations across different ancestry groups. We also carried out um, the analysis for individuals with African ancestry, and we had around 4,000 affected individuals here and 16,000 unaffected individuals. And in this case, um, two separate loci were associated with genome-wide significance, um, and there was one that just missed the threshold, but we're currently adding samples to this, so we have to reevaluate that later. Um, these two genome-wide significant loci um, are located in the DNMT3A gene and SIM1, and um, both have been linked to um, interesting outcomes in, in terms of neural development and um, homeostasis. So like, uh, um, just like for the East Asian locus, we did uh, do a lookup in the European ancestry PGC data for depression. And neither of the two African ancestry loci was associated. One, because it isn't actually observed. Um, so the, the variant frequency is very different between Europeans and um, Africans individuals with African ancestry, so we didn't actually get a result. Um, for the locus on chromosome 2, um, we did not find a significant result. However, the, the variant is extremely rare in individuals with European ancestry, so it, it might in this case just be a matter of frequency. Um, we also did a lookup the other way around. So we took the established depression loci from uh, the GWAS in, in European ancestry and um, checked the results in, in both of our studies. And you can see here just counts of loci that are associated at different p-value thresholds. Um, and overall, we found very little enrichment for significant associations even though in particular for the East Asians, we would expect to see um, around 37 loci um, at 5%. At so we are powered to, to observe associations, even accounting for the frequency. And we did uh, a similar lookup for essentially credible sets um, to make sure, you know, maybe we're, we're missing the, the causal variance in the previous lookup. And similarly, we didn't find much enrichment. Um, finally, we used the, one of the top loci that had, you know, at least a, a p-value of less than 5% in the East Asians. And that's one of the loci that's very consistently associated in the PGC data in UK Biobank um, 23 and Me. So um, we, did, we did hope to see an association here, but um, using a transethnic co-localization method that um, we, we developed a while ago, we did not find evidence that the causal variant here is shared between Europeans and East Asians in this case. So in conclusion, um, you can see the real benefits of including samples with different ancestry. We found three novel population-specific depression loci, and they are population-specific either because uh, the variant essentially isn't observed 
in Europeans or because the effect size seems to be quite different in the case of the East Asian locus. Um, overall, we found little evidence for transferability and suggestions that at least part of the heritability um, might be group specific and there are a lot of potential um, explanation for that. Um, in any case, I think it suggests that um, it's extremely important to include other ancestry groups because there are major findings that we are going to miss um, if we only focus on, on individuals with European ancestry. Okay, and I stop here and thank you very much. Thank you, Caroline. That was uh, that was extremely clear. Thank you. Um, we we don't have any uh, questions um, just at the moment. Just w one thing that that briefly occurred to me when you were giving your talk was the difficulty in in aligning the clinical criteria for depression across different an uh, ancestries and cultures is problematic. Do you think it would be possible to use the genetics to refine or benchmark the diagnosis uh, uh, against each other, or would that be too exploratory? Um, no, I think it's, I mean, at least in one way one could do it, at least testing that if we use the same criteria, do we get the same genetic um, uh, factors? And so, I mean, that doesn't necessarily seem to be the case. We've been doing some more work on, on that because we have studies that have uh, more questioner-based information, others that are used similar tools translated into different languages. Um, so, so far for the East Asians, at least, it seems to be very tricky. Maybe eventually there, there is a, a way to align disease outcomes genetically, but there's, you know, there, there are all these differences in terms of variant frequencies um, as well. And so it's, it's a challenging aspect of trans-ethnic analysis in this context. Great, thank you. Um, we don't have any questions, but we'll save some to the end if they come up during the, the following talks. So um, thank you very much. Um, so, Jerry, you're up next to talk about uh, uh, postpartum MDD. Yes. Let me open it up. Awesome. Well, thank you all for joining today and listening to our talks. Um, today I'll be presenting on work trying to perform the first GWAS for postpartum depression. Uh, so my disclosures, this is just part of my K01. Uh, so just a little bit of background to get everybody on the same page about postpartum depression. Uh, first, it's a common disorder with a 10 to 15% prevalence. And to put this in context, if we have about 4 million births in the US alone, approximately half a million are going to have postpartum depression and it's considered the most common unrecognized complication of the perinatal period. If you compare this to something that gets a little bit more attention, I would say, something like gestational diabetes, which has a prevalence of two to five percent, you can start to see how there's this disproportionately underrepresentation for postpartum depression. Uh, it, it can often be morbid with not only severe consequences like postpartum psychosis where you have suicide and, and, and infanticide, but there are more common effects that can be long lasting, such as the impaired bonding between the mother and infant and uh, low maternal weight gain, preterm birth, which you know, developmentally also have their own set of consequences. And unfortunately, it, it often goes missed or underdiagnosed. Uh, until recently, there hasn't been a standard set of screening for postpartum depression. A couple years back, the US, the US Preventative Health Task Force uh, put out a statement um, advocating for more screening, um, but ultimately it is up to providers to do the screening. And the symptoms are often different from the classic DSM-4 depression, uh, even though within the DSM, it is a subtype of major depression. So studying PPD genetics has its own um, advantages. It's an alternative to studying MDD because it has reduced heterogeneity. They're only looking at females. They're all of reproductive age and they all are exposed to the same biopsychosocial event of pregnancy. So you, you know when to look for these depressive episodes 
and they they are they're often pretty well <laughs> pretty well presenting. Uh, PPD has also been estimated to have a higher heritability compared to major depression in a paper put out uh, in 2016. Uh, but unfortunately, up until this point, there hasn't been any modern genomics methods such as GWAS to identify what those genetic underpinnings are for postpartum depression. Um, so this is where we come in as part of the MDD uh, working group. Uh, within the MDD working group, we have a postpartum depression special interest group. And as of yesterday, we have nearly 15,000 cases identified, along with 49,000 controls that have also been screened. And we are planning to have our data freeze by the end of March. So as Andrew mentioned at the beginning, if anybody has genotype cohorts that are willing to participate, please let me know. Um, but what I'll be presenting on today is just a subset of our total with uh, data from Australian Genetics of Depression Study, a, a cohort here from UNC called Biomom, uh, Generation Scotland, as well as UK Biobank. Uh, so I will warn you, since we are only looking at a subset of the data and everything isn't together yet, everything here is preliminary and we expect results to change for our publication later this year. So when we look at those cohorts that I presented before, this is all European ancestry women. We don't really have anything reaching significance yet with only 8,000, 8,600 cases, 25,000 controls. You see here our best hit is uh, slowly approaching significance. Uh, our estimated heritability is sitting right around 10%, which is encouraging. So taking this, I mentioned before that diagnostically MDD or PPD is a subset of major depression. So we took that and did a genetic correlation with uh, Naomi Ray's paper previously reported and we see a genetic correlation of uh, about 82%. And when we feed our summary statistics into LD Hub to see what other correlations may be present in this preliminary data, we see uh, a number of significant associations, what you would expect, uh, depressive symptoms, subjective well-being, major depression, uh, as well as some PGC cross disorder analyses. And I also included for reference what it looks like compared to other uh, psychiatric disorders. So you can see we, we have some pretty interesting findings here, uh, which is encouraging given that we've only analyzed about half of our cases so far. Uh, and some other interesting traits to look at with regards to uh, pregnancy associated symptoms, uh, neuroticism, which has also been associated with uh, major depression and insomnia, given that the postpartum period is characterized by a lack of sleep because of a newborn. It's very interesting to see. And then as we get more information about this, how do we disentangle this, this sort of information given the phenotype? Um, so it's very encouraging. And one of our, Additional participating cohorts is Converge, which is the Han Chinese uh, cohort. And they have a postpartum depression phenotype, which we were able to utilize. Uh, for cases, there was nearly a thousand compared to 3,300 controls. And you see it, uh, the, the heritability is similar to what we observed in our European ancestry, but the hits are a little bit different. Uh, but we do hope to follow the lead that uh, Carolina presented previously in trying to make the GWAS more inclusive, more uh, generalizable across the populations. So one of the aims that we have is for our final analyses is how do we reconcile those findings from the European cohort and our more um, non-European participants that we have data for. So initially what we can do is just compare the European to the East Asian populations. And Naomi Ray's paper, as I referenced before, they show there is a correlation between the European and East Asian MDD phenotypes, a correlation of 0.31. And so this gave us reason to, for the sake of this presentation, attempt a trans ancestry, trans -ancestry meta-analysis between our four European cohorts with Converge. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have the popcorn results dropped in here, uh, but it will be in the final paper. 
So what we see using a fixed effect model, which I will concede is not the best model for this, but for the sake of the presentation and preliminary interrogation, I'm presenting it here. We see that the observed heritability is still sitting around 10%, but we can increase our case number and see what the results look like. Again, it's we, we don't have anything near the top, but given sample size, given a random effects model will be more appropriate down the line, um, we are hopeful that we, we may see something when we have the full data set presented. Uh, so for future directions, we do plan on completing the analyses with the data freeze, as I mentioned, at the end of March. And we hope to have the paper written up and submitted by the end of the year. We've only processed about half of our cases for the sake of this presentation. Um, we're working with some trans, trans ancestry leaders within the PGC to make sure that these analyses are solid. And uh, as I mentioned, we're continuing to search for cohorts. So if there is anybody, please reach out. And we have ongoing recruitment of PPD samples, particularly within the US and partnering. Uh, we have, this is ongoing study here in the US, uh, as well as Australia, Sweden, and Denmark. Uh, for the US, it's branded as MomGenes, where anybody can download an app to be screened for PPD. If they are a case, we will send them a spit kit and it'll be returned to us here so we can do the, uh, the GWAS on it. So I encourage anybody, if you're here in the US, please spread the word. We're always looking for more cases to help power these types of analyses. And uh, with that, just thank everybody that's been a part of the cohort, uh, the consortia so far. Uh, I've only been able to fit people on here that contributed data for this presentation, but as part of our PPD GWAS, we have several more people to thank. I just couldn't fit them on the slide. So thank you. Great, thank you very much, Jerry. Um, again, a terrific uh, talk. Um, we again, we don't have any questions yet, so um, sure. I, I propose we we move on. And if you could hang around, Jerry, to the end, then sure. if there are any questions, we can uh, we can batch them at the end. So. Uh, we'll move on to our next talk if we if we may. Um, so Mark Adams now is going to present a talk that is r relating um, genetic SEM to major depressive disorder. Mark, over to you. Thanks, Andrew. Okay, so this is a presentation of the um, genomic structure equation modeling of MDD symptoms. Uh, for anyone who's not that familiar with major depression symptoms. Um, they're usually around nine that most inventories and diagnostic criteria will look at. It includes two cardinal symptoms. So um, depressed mood is the first and the second is um, sort of anhedonia that's a diminished interest. And then most of the inventories will have either three or four of the, of the other symptoms required. Um, so this is sort of, comes into the problem that, um, yeah, people might have different sets of symptoms or different configurations. So we want to see if, if there's any genetic heterogeneity uh, behind that. So for at this point in the analysis, uh, we're using samples from the PGC and then two different phenotypes uh, from UK Biobank and um, including the, the city, uh, which is sort of a diagnostic interview very similar to DSM criteria and then a patient health questionnaire um, that's been analyzed previously by Jackson Thorpe. Um, it's sort of a more a measure of current uh, depression. So the first thing we looked at is just doing um, LD score uh, correlations, uh, or sorry, LD score heritabilities of each of these traits. Um, so the one thing we found in the PG sample is actually a lot of the heritabilities were negative. Um, and this is just because of the, the nature of the data. We only had information on symptom uh, presence of people who were cases. So they would have been enriched for the symptoms. So we'd expect a depletion of uh, variation in that sample, uh, thus resulting in um, negative heritabilities. There were four traits in the PGC sample that we were able to get a positive heritability estimate 
uh, which was a decrease in weight, um, an increase in psychomotor agitation, as well as a decrease, um, and then a, um, a symptom related to suicidality and thoughts of death. All of the traits uh, that we had information on in both the city inventory and the PHQ um, were, were heritable in the UK Biobank samples. So the, the next thing we looked at is just um, taking all of the symptoms that had positive heritabilities. We calculated LD score genetic correlations with uh, major depression um, in the PGC sample. So this is going to be um, clinical depression. Um, the first thing we sort of uh, see from the PGC sample is that most of the traits have uh, zero or negative heritabilities, which again is something that we would sort of expect because these individuals have been selected in the sample because they have depression. So the genetic variants for each of these traits are, are going to be decreased. Um, but it, it would give us indication that those ones with a zero genetic correlation would very likely um, relate to sort of the um, yeah, differences within uh, the sample and, and sort of how it, uh, how those symptoms sort of differ in the entire population. Um, whereas suicidality, having, having a positive um, heritability could tell us a little bit more about how people within um, depression have, um, yeah, sort of how, how they differ. So um, just moving on to UK Biobank and PHQ. Uh, PHQ had um, greater heritability with LD score uh, regression. So finally, um, sort of just looking at how all those things uh, correlate with each other. So I've just broken it out into the PGC, UKB City, and UKB PHQ Q samples. And I've just sort of highlighted them um, here in, in blocks to sort of look at the phenotypic correlations among the traits on the, the top of the diagram and then the check correlations on the bottom. Um, so I guess the sort of thing to, to look at that is a lot of the PGC symptoms have negative heritabilities with uh, the normal depression traits, uh, which is something that we would then ex sort of expect from, again, the selection into um, caseness in these samples. So moving on to the genomic structural equation modeling, um, this is a method where you take a matrix of LD score genetic correlations and feed it into the basis of a structural equation or confirmatory um, factor analysis model. So this is sort of moving, um, you know, we're sort of in this molecular GWAS era, but it sort of moves a lot of the kind of questions we have back to what can be what the sort of stuff that we used to do with uh, with twin modeling. So just based on the literature, we looked at uh, four uh, different models um, of sort of modeling the um, the structure of depression symptoms. So the, sort of the baseline model that you always start with is a common factor model where, where all of these traits will just load onto a single common factor. Uh, we looked at two different two-factor models, so either differentiating between a somatic and a psychological trait, or between sort of a um, psychological cognitive versus the somatic traits, as well as a, a three-factor model that sort of breaks those uh, into smaller components. So running those models, um, we can just look at the ones with the best fit using the AIC criteria where a lower number um, is better. And um, I, I guess I should go back and say, we only did this in the UK Biobank samples because we just had four of the traits with positive heritabilities in the PGC sample. So we found that with the um, UK Biobank City, the two-factor model had the best fit. And in the UK Biobank PHQ, the three-factor model had the best fit, 
although the fit was very similar between the three-factor model and one of the, um, the two-factor models. So finally, what we did is we just uh, looked at the correlations of these factors with um, other different traits that are well known to be genetically correlated with, uh, with major depression. And in the UK Biobank City, um, sort of what we see is these, um, the psychological symptoms, so a, a common factor explaining the, the shared genetic variance between those psychological symptoms had very um, strong positive genetic correlation with uh, other psychiatric disorders and with personality traits that are um, predisposing factors to developing major depression, as well as with various measures of depression itself, and um, a negative correlation with BMI whereas the, um, the somatic factor um, had a um, just sort of a barely positive um, correlation with, with BMI. But then when we look at the PHQ, um, sort of all of the different factors were, were strongly correlated um, with most of the um, sort of the major psychiatric um, traits and just a little bit less uh, with somatic factors like um, body mass index. Um, okay, and just thanks for everyone who uh, worked on this and um, send any questions to the chat. Great, thank you very much, Mark. Thanks, that's, uh, uh, that's great. Um, we don't have any questions so far. So again, we'll, um, we'll just move on to the next talk if that's okay. Um, so the next person uh, is uh, Ollie Payne, who's going to speak about his GWAS analysis of antidepressant treatment response. Uh, good afternoon. Yeah, I'm Ollie Payne, and today I'm going to be presenting results of a collaboration within the MDD working group focusing on antidepressant response. So antidepressants are a first-line treatment for MDD. However, only a third of individuals respond to their first prescribed medication. A previous study showed evidence that a uh, substantial proportion of this these individual differences in response can be attributed to common genetic variation. And therefore, a genome-wide association study, or GWAS, is an appropriate strategy for gaining insight into the underlying biology and may also enable uh, genetic-based prediction of antidepressant response. However, to achieve these aims, uh, GWAS requires large GWAS uh, sample sizes. And uh, despite uh, several previous genome-wide association studies of antidepressant response, uh, they've all had a sample size less than 3,000 individuals, which has limited their ability to identify robust genetic associations. So the aim of this collaboration was to combine these previously used data sets as well as uh, novel data sets with antidepressant response data uh, to provide a GWAS with improved power to identify associated loci and genes, uh, estimate the SNP heritability uh, with better accuracy, uh, evaluate evidence for genetic overlap with related outcomes, and then using these uh, GWAS results, test whether we can predict out of sample. So this table shows uh, a list of the cohorts currently involved in the collaboration. Uh, in total, we have over 7,100 individuals uh, with a clinical diagnosis of MDD and antidepressant uh, response uh, assessed both at baseline and um, after treatment. And uh, I'm just gonna talk about the top uh, 10 cohorts as these were the cohorts with antidepressant response, uh, sorry, with individual level data and that were of European ancestry, uh, which was required for the analyses we wanted to present. So uh, this subset of the data contains uh, over 5,300 individuals. And I just wanna highlight, there are some differences between these cohorts 
um, such as uh, different medications prescribed, although the vast majority were SSRIs, and also um, some differences in the measures used to ass assess depressive symptoms. We defined antidepressant response using two measures. Uh, one measure was remission, which is a binary measure, uh, which uh, is defined uh, with an individual defined as remitting if their uh, symptom score was below a predefined threshold after taking the antidepressant. And this threshold was specific to each of the depressive symptom scales used. And this measure is particularly relevant for prognosis. And then the other uh, measure we used was percentage improvement, which is a continuous measure uh, comparing baseline symptom severity to endpoint uh, depressive symptoms. And this continuous measure is uh, it's thought to provide better statistical power. This slide shows an overview of the uh, preparation and analysis of the genetic data. In, in, uh, in summary, the quality control and imputation was um, performed uh, using the Rikipedi pipeline. And uh, I just want to highlight that when we're doing the association analysis, we included the, uh, a covariate for the remission analysis, which was baseline severity. On the right shows the analyses that we performed uh, using the individual level data and the GWAS summary statistics, but I'm just going to talk about the results using the individual level data uh, here. So just to give you an overview of the GWAS summary statistics, uh, there were uh, no genome-wide significant associations, um, although this isn't uh, so surprising given the sample size is still modest. Um, but reassuringly, there was no evidence of confounding uh, in, the, in the QQ plots. So estimate, we estimated SNP heritability of these measures using Dremel in GCTA. And when looking across all the samples combined, we found that uh, remission had a statistically significant SNP heritability with a point estimate of 13%, whereas percentage improvement did not show significant heritability. And this is interesting given these two measures have a strong phenotypic correlation and suggests that these measures are capturing something slightly different uh, relating to antidepressant response um, and could also reflect uh, that perhaps remission is less vulnerable to random fluctuations in symptom severity or other factors affecting antidepressant response. And this is something we need to further understand future studies. Given the heterogeneity between the cohorts, um, we are aware that this, uh, when estimating the heritability across all the cohorts combined, um, this estimate of heritability uh, is going to be lower than it would be within a homogeneous context. So uh, we were interested to see how much uh, of the variance could be explained by common genetic variation within a homogeneous context. And we did this by estimating the heritability within each cohort separately, and then meta-analyzing the within sample estimates. And these are shown in blue, uh, whereas the across sample estimates are shown in red. And what you can see here is that, uh, firstly, remission still shows a higher heritability than percentage improvement. But uh, importantly, both uh, measures show a significant SNP heritability within this homogeneous context. And this uh, really underlines uh, the potential for genome-wide association studies of antidepressant response to gain insight into this, this important phenotype. So next we looked at evidence of genetic overlap with a, a group of selected outcomes. And this was done using polygenic scoring and subsequent Avenge Me analysis. And uh, you can see the outcomes that we checked for a uh, overlap with on the left and on the x-axis shows the estimate of genetic covariance for each of the depressive uh, response measures. And I just wanna highlight a few things. Firstly, that a genetic liability for psychosis was associated with poor response of antidepressants and this uh, fits with previous literature saying that um, psychiatric comorbidity 
is associated with poorer response to antidepressants. Second, a genetic propensity to educational attainment was associated with improved response to antidepressants. And this also fits uh, with previous literature uh, reporting that uh, high levels of uh, increased socioeconomic status uh, predicts better response to antidepressants. And lastly, uh, we found uh, kind of novel evidence that a, a ASD genetic liability actually improved response to antidepressants. And this finding needs to be replicated first, but it's quite interesting as a recent paper looking at the genetics of CBT response found the opposite relationship, indicating this uh, could be a useful uh, indicator for making clinical decisions. So last, we using the uh, GWAS data we had, uh, we wanted to test whether we could actually predict antidepressant response out of sample. And we did this using a leave one out uh, polygenic scoring design. And the results are shown here uh, for emission and percentage improvement. And uh, along the x-axis -ax -x are different p-value thresholds and on the y's the r squared of the polygenic scores out of sample. And we found that for both phenotypes there was evidence that we could uh, predict statistically significant uh, variants out of sample with multiple thresholds achieving nominal significance. Um, you know, despite uh, the, the R squared being low of 0.1%, this is really reassuring uh, results indicating that as we include more samples into this project, uh, we will be able to improve this prediction of sample and this also can be a useful research tool. So in conclusion, we found evidence that the antidepressant response is heritable and uh, common genetic variation, investigation of common genetic variation can provide insights into the underlying biology. A genetic liability to psychosis is associated with poorer response and a genetic propensity to education was associated with improved response. And lastly, that uh, with our results, we were able to predict statistically significant amounts of variance out of sample. So uh, I would like to thank Andrew McIntosh and Catherine Lewis for leading this collaboration and all of the PIs who have contributed data so far. And if anyone knows of other data sets with antidepressant response information, uh, please get in touch with one of us. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ollie. Um, while Ollie's um, uh, uh, unsharing his screen, uh, just to let you know that we do have we do actually have several questions now so a couple of them are for Ollie and uh, we've uh, two for other speakers so I'll, I'll read out the, uh, the first one so um, it's a question from Carolina and it's essentially um, around the uh, around the the theme of uh, of how does variation in the drug used in each study affect your results have you looked at the have you looked at the specific drugs used and perhaps combinations uh, yeah it's a really good question and currently we've only looked across all of the samples. As I said, the vast majority were SSRIs. Um, but yeah, down the line, we should uh, see whether we can, uh, how many individuals we can pull together that are on the same, the same medication. Great, thank you. So a question for Jerome for you, Oli, as well. So uh, how many of the samples measured blood levels of medication? Uh, do the polygenic risk scores hold in those samples? And uh, I think his question relates to compliance and whether compliance may be an issue and something that you should consider. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I'm not sure which samples have blood levels of medication. I know some of them do. Um, so yeah, I can't answer the question about how the PRS predicts in them, but I will uh, look into that. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, and again from Jerome. Uh, Jerry, um, so it's a question for you. Um, do you get the impression that postpartum depression is less heterogeneous than major depressive disorder as a whole? Uh, given the preliminary data, it's kind of hard to say, especially given that many of these samples, it's, and this is something that comes up a lot within the perinatal depression work, is, is it 
when you measure a postpartum depression episode, um, most of them are going to be have a history of not only MDD but also anxiety or other psychiatric disorders. So it's hard to tease out, you know, how much of it is sort of an organic PPD driven by the event, or is it just happened to be some sort of uh, depression episode that happens to occur at that time point. So I think it, it's, it's hard to say how much of it may just be that these women have a particular type of MDD and it may not be all that different or all of its own same. I, I think right now it's just really hard to say. <laughs> Given the results so far, the heritability doesn't look that much different than MDD. Uh, most of our samples were recruited because they have a history of MDD. So genetically, we're expecting a lot of them just to look very similar, uh, but we're hoping that there's a slight component that we can identify that may differentiate them. So stay tuned with more samples like this. Thank you, that's great. So um, our next question is from Christelle uh, Middledorp and it's from Mark. So Mark, uh, um, Crystal mentions work showing that depression um, can be somewhat stratified into those that have increased uh, appetite and weight gain from those that don't. And she asks if you've been, if you've considered including this in your factor analysis. Um, yeah, so, so that is something that we include um, in that. So when we were, when we're modeling a common factor, um, there's actually a, a covariance is estimated between those directional symptoms. So, th so that is accounted for. Um, and in fact, you can, sort, you can see in the plot of just the cross correlations between everything that the directional symptoms are negatively correlated uh, with each other. So yeah, that is something we're looking at. Okay, great. And uh, a final question so far from um, James Kennedy. So, um, and I think it's for, for you, Ollie. Um, have you considered covering for cytochrome P450 gene status uh, or looking specifically at variation in that locus? Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Again, um, we haven't covaried for uh, the cytochrome status, but it's uh, something we should look into. Um, first, we need to uh, work out the best approach for inferring some of the SIP haplotypes, um, which I know is easier for some than others. But thank you. Okay. Great. So I think we're coming to uh, nearly, we're nearly on the hour. Thank you for all the speakers for, uh, for excellent talks and for, for keeping to time. And thanks to all the trouble, uh, thanks to all the people who've, uh, who've gone to the trouble of posing questions. So yeah, thank you very much everyone for, for taking part in the Worldwide Lab today. I'm going to, uh, uh, I think we're about to end the call uh, when we reach the hour, but, but thanks again and cheerio.